I'll, I'll pass it over to uh, our next presentation. Uh, our next presentation, so Amy was uh, originally uh, going to join us, but um, her colleague, Max Cooper, the head of audience and uh, head of audience development um, from um, Nine, which has a multiple range of mass titles, whether it's Brisbane, Brisbane Times, SMH, WA Today, it's a national um, publisher in Australia. Uh, she's going to be going through the subject on newsletter and audience development through newsletters. So the con just a bit, a bit of a synopsis, uh, this year particularly newsletters has become revitalized, particularly as we're shifting towards uh, the depreciation of third party cookies. And just, you know, as many of the panelists and the contributors have emphasized around really building communities and emphasizing more on brand building. So, um, with particularly nine, uh, the conversations that we've had, like they've sort of had to restart again at a more, there's, the less, there's gonna be lessons here that you can learn um, in terms of how to do certain strategies and also um, their journey on how they had to go through and reinvent that process um, internally. So I'll pass it over to Max. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so yes, my name is Max Cooper. I'm head of audience development for uh, Nine's Metro Publishing Masters, which include um, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, which are our biggest uh, newspapers and websites. Um, I was previously, however, our newsletter editor, so um, I'm well versed to speak about our transformation for newsletters. Uh, so if you just bear with me, I'll just share my screen. Thank you. Um, so yes, so if you go to the next slide there, um, so um, we're part of the audience development team and the audience development team, we're really the voice of the audience in every room in our, um, in our business. Uh, so we look at in particular what is engaging our audiences, what is driving them to subscribe, what are their habits and how are their habits changing. Uh, we're also very much the linchpin, um, the bridge in and out of our editorial newsroom. So we deal a lot as the sort of conduit between our product team and editorial and our commercial sales team and editorial, and also our subscription and marketing team who we work very closely with. Uh, in terms of our um, role, we feel very strongly that a lot of our role is understanding what's important to our readers as well as what's important to our um, journalists and newsrooms and to distinguish with it if it's, if it's important that it's our job to make it interesting. So a lot of our role is feeding back audience data and behaviour to our editorial newsrooms but we do understand very strongly that journalism can't be defined just by numbers and data alone. However, we do know that if we, we believe a story is important to tell, that it's our job to make it interesting so that people will engage with it. So the next slide, thank you. Um, our mastheads in particular in Australia are very much known uh, for our quality journalism, our investigations and our public service journalism, as well as um, a really broad sweep of content from ranging from food to travel, lifestyle and culture. Um, we're particularly known for journalism that has a, a strong impact on people's lives and our society as well. And to do that, we need to find a meaningful audience. And by meaningful, we mean one that we have a relationship with um, that is not like a, someone paying us a one-off visit to read one story. Um, it's much more of a deeper relationship than that. And to have those kind of relationships, we really need to stay connected to our audiences, which in a time of uh, digital media, when media has become um, fragmented and there's sort of endless sources of information, that has become harder and harder. And in order to see growth, we know that um, we have to uh, really become an essential part of people's lives. We have to be something that they interact with daily, not just like once in a blue moon. Uh, we're very much a subscription-based business, so people need to have a value for their subscription. So we really need to be an essential daily habit for those. And for all of those objectives, newsletters really help us to achieve all those things, to stay connected to our communities, to build really meaningful um, relationships with them and to become an essential part of their everyday. 
So newsletters, why you should uh, look at newsletters and why publishers are increasingly focusing on newsletters is because they really offer a myriad of opportunities to connect with readers directly um, without giving up control to third party platforms and channels. It's very much a relationship between you and your audiences. So we know, for instance, that readers who sign up to New York Times newsletters are twice as likely to become subscribers. Uh, the, the UK's The Times and The Sunday Times also report that subscribers who engage with their daily newsletter are 49% less likely to churn, so 49% less likely to cancel their subscription. And we've also done analysis on our newsletters, and we know that it's an incredibly um, important retention tool for our subscribers. So if we can get subscribers signed up to newsletters, they are much, much more likely to stay subscribers than if they don't. Uh, we also have editorial control. So we control the newsletters and readers get to decide when they read them. So those decisions aren't left up to um, big social media platforms or search platforms. Um, when someone sees something and, and what they see isn't decided by an algorithm, it's decided by the relationship we've built with that um, reader. So when platforms like Facebook uh, stop prioritising news, we've been okay because all of our focus is really on driving direct engagement with our products. So whether that's um, them coming direct to our homepage to read our stories on our homepage or to reread them in the app or very much so with our newsletters, it gives us a lot more control over our own destiny and on the way that our own journalism is consumed. They're also really um, curated newsletters. So um, at Clean Combat News Fatigue, we know post COVID, uh, there is a real sense of people being overwhelmed by the news, particularly the horrendous conflict that's going on at the moment. Newsletters are a way to sort of have um, a curated experience of news without it being an overwhelming feed of news that you're faced with. You can also really target readers with content that they are interested in and passionate about without them having to search around to try and find it. So emails are old. I'm sure everyone um, probably remembers their old email account. Um, I'm embarrassed to say I still have a Hotmail account that I had probably back in the year 2000. Um, it's so old that it has been, its death has been predicted a number of times, but it keeps surviving. Uh, often with the new sort of uh, messages services like Slack and so on, when they were first around, people predicted that emails were going to go, um, we're going to die death. But but no, anyone who works for a company, I'm sure, is familiar that you, you still get many emails every single day. And while emails are old, uh, so are we. So um, we are uh, come from a really strong legacy print background, but we're at now very much a digitally focused media company. But we are our um, flagship masthead, the Sydney Morning Herald, is 192 years old, and our Melbourne-based uh, masthead, The Age, will turn 170 years old next year. Uh, some of our newsletters were also very old. So I became a newsletter editor um, in 2020. And when I first started looking at some of our newsletters, they were decades old. We didn't actually um, have any idea with some of them how people had even gotten on those newsletter lists. Um, they weren't being monitored. Uh, people didn't um, sort of know the open rates or any of the kind of metrics around them. Essentially, there was people in the newsroom whose job it was to kind of put a list together very quickly and it was like a box they ticked as part of their job, but no one really um, put any care or love into curating them or working out the best content for them. Uh, at that stage, we had 14 newsletters. Um, and when I did look at the average open rate, it was about 25%, some were as low as 15%. And now that average is 49% and it can be as high as 84% for some of our newsletters. So in terms of how we got there and what we did, um, we wanted to make our newsletters easy to build, easy to find and easy to measure. So the first thing that we did was we did an audit of our existing newsletters and we decided whether we should um, relaunch them, sort of rebrand them, give them a refresh 
whether we should actually just kill them off. And at that stage, we were actually still promoting newsletters on our newsletter sign-up page that we hadn't been sending for a number of years, um, whether to launch new newsletters and then finally how we would go about promoting them. So the first thing that we looked at was how to make that easy. And the first part of doing that was making newsletters easy to build. Uh, so when we first started really focusing and putting love into our newsletter offering, um, they were built in a number of different systems. They were quite clunky to build. Certainly any that had any kind of narrative introduction or so on were very time consuming to build. Um, you had to sort of upload lots of different photos and cut them in different ways. Then there were other ones that were very simple and sort of unappealing newsletters that were just lists that people would drop and drag into, but no one really kind of had any connection to them. And they were very much removed from all the other systems where we did our journalism. So our product team worked really hard to put our newsletters into our CMS, which is called Inc., uh, which is a bespoke um, version of WordPress. Uh, and our newsletters are now all built within our CMS. Uh, they have specific templates and they're very, very easy to build. Each newsletter has its own template, but you can, uh, those templates are very flexible. You can add images, you can edit copy, you can make them as long or short as you want, and you can very easily drop in content from within our CMS. And it's in the same place that we do all of our other work. Our next step was to make our newsletters easy to find. Um, again, when we first started looking at our newsletters, they were buried on a sort of page off um, our homepage. You couldn't see them anywhere on our homepage. It was very difficult to find out that they even existed or where you would sign up to them. So one of the first things that we did was we um, rebuilt our newsletter page so that it looked engaging before um, we relaunched our newsletter page, all of the artwork promoting the newsletters was very generic stock images, very dull colors, didn't really speak to what the newsletter was um, and very uninviting. So we got um, one of our editorial artists to redesign all of the tiles for our newsletters. We gave them all a specific sort of looking look and theme. So you can see that they all have a, a similar stylistic look there. We also, um, started promoting them on our homepage. We have a strap at the hop, top of our homepage that we call the CTA strap, which is a call to action strap. And we started to promote um, the different newsletters in there so that the readers were aware of them. And we rotate those each day so that people get an idea of the different newsletters available. We also got all of our um, editorial and editorial workers to start putting signups to newsletters in the bottom of every story. So in every single one of our articles, you will find a tagline at the bottom of it that encourages them to sign up to a newsletter. We also had QR codes um, in the wake of COVID. QR codes obviously started to become used quite a lot. So we have them in print ads. And even when we go out to events um, and things like that, we have QR codes that people are very um, able to kind of quickly scan and they can sign up to the newsletters. So that was another easy way for people to find them. We then wanted to make them easy to measure. Um, as I previously said, people weren't really looking at the metrics of our newsletters. And with all journalism, obviously as being part of our audience development team, we know that being able to feedback audience uh, data to our newsrooms is really important to be able to see what's working and what's not and why that might be happening. So we had specific dashboards built for our newsletters. We have one that really focuses on the performance of each newsletter send, and we have another one that really tracks the journey of a newsletter sign up. So we have a number of different um, metrics that we now measure. They're really comprehensive newsletters, uh, newsletter dashboards. They have heat maps and graphs. Um, they track not just the traditional kind of metrics that people think about, like open rate, send count, click to open rate. Also things like how recently someone's opened a newsletter, how frequently they open a newsletter, what kind of audience overlap there is between newsletters, uh, what sort of a journey they have on our website after they click into our um, content from a newsletter. So you get a really comprehensive view of the audience for our newsletters. Uh, the next thing that we wanted to do, um, well, and so once we did that, we then 
um, went through that process, we do that constantly now on repeat. So we are constantly auditing our newsletters. We sort of haven't just launched them, promoted them and let them sit. Sometimes we decide that a newsletter really isn't working. We're not afraid to sort of um, kill off ones that, you know, might have been working at one stage but aren't anymore. It was particularly difficult when we, we had a coronavirus newsletter daily throughout um, COVID that was incredibly well loved and readers um sent us amazing feedback of, about how much it meant to them in their lives during that um, sort of struggling period. Um, but at some stage we had to say that that newsletter had served its purpose and we stopped it. Um, we also had another newsletter that we launched for our culture team that just never really worked in the way that we wanted it to. So we had to make the decision to stop doing that so that we could use those resources to, to push it into something else. So we're constantly looking at the feedback for different newsletters and deciding what the what the next step for those newsletters will be. Our newsletters uh, also serve uh, different purposes. So we have a number of newsletters now that are subscriber only, and we're increasingly launching more subscriber only newsletters. Uh, we know they play such an incredible part in retention. Um, and it's a great benefit for our subscriber and marketing team to be able to promote certain newsletters as subscriber only. Uh, the way that we've chosen whether they're subscription only um, is to really look at what what value they're giving to readers and also we have really targeted um, particular journalists who we know through our reader research and our audience data are really beloved by um, our subscribers. So Ross Gittins, as an example, has been with our Sydney Morning Herald for 45 years. He's an incredibly loved and respected economics correspondent and his um, subscriber only newsletter has been amazingly popular. So we're really um, looking at these newsletters to add value to subscriptions. Other newsletters, however, we are using to try and attract new readers, in particular younger and female readers. Um, so we have one that's greater good that is really offering people, and this was launched during COVID, um, but it's, it's continued to to get really um, strong reader feedback. So it offers people a chance to escape that sort of um, grim news cycle when they're looking for something that's like a different kind of journalism. And we get some amazing um, individual feedback from readers who really appreciate being able to have that sort of stories presented to them that sometimes they might miss if they're just looking on our homepages. Uh, our Live Well newsletter is a uh, lifestyle newsletter around how to sort of, you know, fitness, nutrition, lifestyle tips, that sort of thing. And um, it's really aimed at the, a younger female readership. Real Money offers practical money advice, and that's been really great at scooping up some new audience for us. And Wealth Generation is one for our um, one of our sister mastheads, the Australian Financial Review, <coughs> that is really aimed at looking at aspirational investors. So we do use newsletters to target different audiences and we treat them differently and promote them differently depending on what the purpose of that newsletter is. We also use our newsletters to really provide context and again to battle that sense of news fatigue. This is particularly important when publishers are trying to figure out how to attract younger readers. We've done a lot of market research with younger readers that tell us that um, quite often, if they're reading something, there's a sense of assumed knowledge about a topic. We really try hard in our newsletters to provide context, and you can do that quite quickly with a sort of how we got here, some links to um, previous stories that we've done, that sort of thing. So um, that's been really appreciated by readers. It also is a summary where you can get across um, a day's news or you can get across a topic's um, issues and that sort of thing really quickly without having to scan through lots and lots of content. Our morning edition is incredibly popular and really if you have only have sort of a certain amount of time every day, you could read the morning edition and be really well briefed across the day's most important stories. We also have uh, newsletters that we've particularly aimed at sort of more niche communities. So the great thing about newsletters is that you are able to serve up content that people are particularly passionate about to that particular audience. Um, two really strong examples have been Examine, which is our science newsletter, 
which when we did some um, research with readers, we asked them what sort of, we gave them some options and we were surprised to see that they were incredibly interested in science. Uh, our science um, senior journalist was also incredibly excited and he has been fantastic at writing a really personable narrative newsletter about science and it's incredibly popular. It's the kind of thing that might not have got as much homepage prominence in the past, but now it, it does. And we've been able to really establish a great community with those science readers. Another one is Booklist. We do a huge amount of um, book reviews and book content, but it's a difficult thing to put a book review at the top of our homepage and it certainly wouldn't stay there for very long. And for people who are really interested in that content, it was often hard for them to find it. The Booklist is one of our strongest um, newsletter performers. Uh, it has an incredibly high open rate and a really um, strong list. And people really love it because they get all their content in one place and it's written by our literary editor who's a very well-respected um, expert on books. So it's just a couple of ways where you can really target particular audiences with stuff that they're passionate about. Um, newsletters have also been able to really drive engagement on site. So at a time when we have seen the, these charts are for um, the Australian Financial Review, and what you can see there is that top chart is showing the different session referrers for AFR subscribers. The yellow line by far the most prominent is direct, so they, they come direct to us. But when you take out direct, that bottom chart shows you the different referrers there. And you can see throughout 2023 that newsletters have now actually overtaken search as the referrer for subscribers to AFR's content. For the metros, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, we've very much seen that newsletters are, are much more um, dominant in terms of referring our subscribers to us than, for instance, social. And our social session referrers are on a decline continually, as um, particularly Facebook has sort of turned away from promoting news articles. So newsletters have really stepped into that and are a great source for driving people back to our content. Um, all this change and growth in newsletters wouldn't have been able to be accomplished without a transformation first within our newsrooms around what newsletters were and the importance of them. Um, so when we first started looking at them, like I um, said before, people really thought that they were just a kind of tick box they had to do at the end of their shift. No one really cared much about them. No one wrote them as a sense. It was just a list of stories. We had to really show why they were important. Um, and we've been able to do that with uh, really, um, we did a lot of work when someone started a newsletter, feeding them back the audience data, but also the, the actual, the audience feedback that people write in, which is by far the nicest feedback I think we get um, across any of our other distribution platforms. So being able to feed that back to journalists and show them just how important it was and you could they could see the data and how quickly the lists grew and how much people were engaging with that content. And then we were able to spread that mes message across the newsroom to the point now that the most senior people in our newsrooms um, write newsletters and particularly subscriber only newsletters because they are seen as such valuable um, pieces of content for our journalists. And we're now sort of actually, you know, constantly being asked, can I write a newsletter rather than having to beg people to write a newsletter. So it has involved a, a cultural change within the newsrooms. Um, so when we are being asked, should, 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 can I write a newsletter? Because it, it can be a bit of a sort of, um, knee-jerk reaction to sort of some, the, something that someone wants to do or if they just want to get their story out there. But there are lots of questions that we like to ask um, before, before we launch a newsletter. Um, primarily, we want to know who it's for. So you need to be able to define who the audience is for this newsletter. Does it meet a specific audience need? For example, one of our um, newsletters, What's for Dinner, is literally giving people one recipe every day about an easy recipe they can cook for dinner that night. It's a sort of service that we're providing to a reader. Is it meeting readers' interests, what they're actually looking for, rather than what suits our newsroom structure? It's really about meeting the audience need. And is it good for the brand? Is it something that our brands care about and what we want to be seen to care about? Um, how do we know 
this, that we're targeting the right newsletter? So what data do we have to justify the decision to launch a newsletter? What reader feedback do we have? What reader market research do we have? And also what the experience is of other mastheads. So we're often looking at other publishers to see what newsletters they're offering and also which ones they start and which ones they stop because it can give you a clue about what might have worked and what might not have worked. Resourcing is incredibly popular. No newsroom has endless amounts of resources, so you need to decide up front who is going to write it, who is going to produce it, how much new content is needed for that newsletter as opposed to repackaging existing content, who... Um, who will also like edit it to make sure it's there and to also to make sure that there's a commitment that they're not going to be interested in doing this for a couple of weeks and then say, oh, I can't do it this week because once you have a newsletter, you really need to establish that habit with readers. Um, we also ask questions around what form it should take. So if it's narrative or list, uh, the length, the sections and so on. So there's lots of questions we need to ask before we launch um, a new newsletter. That's about it from me, but um, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. So, uh, sorry. Thank you so much, Max. That was, that was very insightful on the, the journey. Um, some questions that I have is, um, so do individual uh, contributors, are they... Um, also crit critiqued or like measured by because you've come in that background first as well are there certain uh, metrics that they are given to determine the to contribute to success of the newsletter or not in terms of the people who write write them yep. yeah so certain, anyone, yeah. yeah so everyone can access our dashboard and then we measure each individual newsletter <clears throat> so we regularly feedback to our journalists um you know this is how many open rates this one got and sometimes it might be that you know particularly we look at the subject line maybe this kind of theme that you've you've written on before works really well this one doesn't as an example we once did for our watch list which is really about what you can stream on smart tvs uh, we did a special once on sort of where we broke up everything for the whole month that you could stream rather than just doing it weekly. And it was really, really well read. So we started doing that every single month. So now we do a monthly special of that particular newsletter. So we look at that feedback all the time and we feed it back to the journalists and try and repeat what has worked and try and avoid what might not have worked so much. Thank you. One quick question because we're almost out of time. Uh, Dushant writes, are you able to assign a monetary value to a newsletter user? If so, can you share a range? Oh, um, I'm afraid I, I, I can't. Um, and it's, it's a good question because they're valuable in different ways. So, for instance, we very much see most of our value for subscriptions being uh, newsletters being about retention, so retaining those existing subscribers, but I can't give you a monetary value on it. But having said that, we are also getting commercial value out of them because we have certain advertisers who really want those targeted audiences. So, for example, one of our business newsletters from the start of next year will have a certain section that is sponsored by a particular advertiser because they want to get everyone who reads that newsletter. So we've been able to get monetary value out of selling ads in them as or out of getting the subscription value. So I don't have a specific uh, figure for you, but I can tell you that there's a number of ways you can get monetary value out of newsletters. Thank you. Just one more quick one. The screenshot that you showed with the uh, metrics uh, was that measuring tool custom built? Was that from WordPress or are you using a third party tool? It was custom built by our um, data team. So they've, they've built two, two different dashboards for us that, yeah, they're, they're great. <laughs> they're very effective. Um, I'd be happy to share too. We did a sort of an in my blog post on those dashboards as well, which has got a bit more information about them. So if that's of use to anyone, I'm happy to share that yeah. around as well. That'd be great if you could share that to us and we'll share it to all the reg registrants and attendees today. And yeah, I'm sure they'll get great value from it. Sure, no problems. Awesome. So Max, thank you so much for stepping in for Amy and for your uh, presentation as well. It was very helpful and valuable. So thank you for your time and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's awesome.